Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In Lecture 46, as we end up our series uh, in Chapter 7 about pre-calculus, I want to review the idea of domain. Now, the way that one determines the domain of a function has a lot to do with how that function is represented. And we've seen many different ways of representing functions throughout uh, this lecture series. The one you see on the screen right now is what if we just represent the function in some type of numerical format? What if we just know specific points like when x equals 10, f of x will equal negative 12. When x equals 14, f of x equals negative 6. Or in other words, when you take 18, f of 18 is negative 2. What if we have just some type of numerical calculation, like we have a scatter plot. This is just sort of like a little baby scatter plot. Uh, she's so adorable. But if we just have this, right? And this is oftentimes how a function gets started. We collect data through some type of observation or survey or poll or what have you. We collect data and then we try to determine an algebraic formula from that. It's very common to represent a function using this type of numerical expression. So what do we mean by the domain and range? of a numerically given function like so. Well, recall that for a function f, its domain is the set of actual input values, and the range is the set of the actual output values. So if your function is given as a scatter plot or table or some type of numerical collection, then the domain is very easy to identify. You just look at what are all the x coordinates of the actual points inside of my function here. Well, you get that the domain of our function f uh, is going to simply be, well, okay, we have an x equals 10, we have an x equals 14, we have an x equals 18, we have an x equals 22, we have an x equals 26, and an x equals 30. That's all there is to it. And if you want to know what's the actual, you know, what's the range, what are the actual output values? Well, we look at the y coordinates right here, and we see that the range of our function f right here well, what points do we get? We get negative 12, we get negative 6, we get negative 2, we get 1, we get 3, we get 8. Uh, and so this, this right here then gives us the domain and range. And so when you have like a scatter plot or this table uh, tabular representation of a function, finding the domain and range is really just coming down to reading it. It's like what are the actual points used? What are the actual x coordinates? What are the actual y coordinates? Well, once, once you have a data set, you know, so maybe... We have our scatter plot that looks to me like something like this, maybe. Again, just hypothetically speaking, maybe we have some type of scatter plot like this. Well, once you have your data, it might not fit a perfect function, but then we can use some type of statistical regression method to find a curve of best fit. And maybe we get something like the following. So then we move from this numerical representation of the function, perhaps to a geometric or graphical representation of the function. So our function, not given by a formula, but is given by here a graph. Okay, so if we have a graph, what can we find? How can we find the domain and range? Well, again, the domain and range are going to be the actual input values, the actual output values of the picture. We're following the usual convention, the horizontal, which we typically call X, will be our input, and the vertical variable, typically called Y, will be our output. So as we look up along this graph right here, the, f the, the farthest left x value you can find is right here at 1, 2, negative 3. And as we go through the graph, we get every point along the x-axis up until the point x equals 3. And so then this indicates to us that the domain of our function f this time would be the interval negative 3 to 3. So unlike the previous one, which we actually had a finite number of points for our function, this one, because of its a continuous nature, we actually get an interval of points inside the domain. So we'll write this in interval notation, negative 3 to 3. Now we are going to use closed brackets because notice when we see this filled in dot, that means the point is included there. So there is a point whose x coordinate is negative 3, and there is a point whose y coordinate, or whose x coordinate is positive 3, excuse me. To find the y coordinates, that is to find the actual range here, this one gets a little bit more funky the way we draw it, but we basically want to ask ourselves, well, how far down the graph can we go? Um, we can come all the way down to negative 2, for which there are points, right? You have this point right here, negative 3, negative 2. This is a point that actually realizes negative 2 as its y coordinate. We also have this point over here, 2 comma negative 2. The fact that there's a multiplicity does not change the fact this is still a function. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one function because it does fail the horizontal line test, but that's not a requirement we need right now. So the smallest value we find in the range is going to be negative 2, 
And then what's the biggest value? We can go up, 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 up here to positive two. Um, in fact, we have the point negative one comma two. And so then the range will be negative two to two that we can see right there. And so when we, of course, have this graph, we can look at the graph to see what are the actual x coordinates, what are the actual y coordinates we have here. And so let's see the progression we had so far. We went from a data driven that is numerical representation of the function, which has a limited domain and range. Then we can actually progress into a graphical one by statistical techniques of regression. But really our ultimate goal is gonna be moving on to the algebraic representation of a function. So the most interesting consideration, of course, are these algebraic uh, representations. That is, we want to come up with a formula to represent the picture that we drew previously. Now, according to the domain convention, the domain of a formulaic function f is going to be all real numbers x, such that f of x is also a real number. So we need a real number coming in and a real number coming out. That's what our domain convention has been all about. Now, there are some stipulations why we might have to avoid this, right? Sometimes we have to specify the domain, either implicitly or explicitly. Sometimes we might say that, oh, it doesn't make sense for X to be a negative number. Uh, so therefore we might restrict the domain to be non-negatives. Uh, this is very common in a story prompt situation. That's our fourth representation of a function, some type of verbal description, right? So there might be sort of real life uh, stipulations that say, oh, F of X can't be that, or X can't be this. Another stipulation we have to come up with sometimes is, you know, if we're doing like population growth, we can't have half of a person or we can't have three quarters of a bacterium or anything like that. So it might be that the domain, excuse me, the range actually has to be restricted to only whole numbers and rounding can compensate for those things. So there are sometimes uh, real life stipulations that will require that we restrict beyond than what the domain convention is already saying. But the domain convention is like, hey, we'll assume the domain to be as big as possible unless there's something else that tells us to restrict it. So we take our formula and we're going to say we'll accept any real number x so long as f of x is a well-defined real number. So we've studied many, many functions in this lecture series so far. We've talked about linear functions, quadratic functions, absolute value functions. Uh, we've talked about polynomial functions, rational functions, piecewise functions, radical functions, exponential functions, logarithmic, logarithmic functions. And that's, of course, just sort of the tip of the iceberg. These are some of these algebraic and transcendental functions we've been studying. In a trigonometry course, such as Math 1060 at, at SUU, you can talk about some of the trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, tangent, arc tangent, arc cosine, arc uh, uh, what did I say? Well, just, just to list a few. We don't need to list every single one of them, right? Um, and of course, we can also kind of combine these functions together, right? What if we take these functions, you know, power functions, exponential functions, their inverses like radicals and logarithms. What if we start combining them together using the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, composition, so we could put functions inside of them. We could also use piecewise, amal uh, piecewise amalgamation. That is, we could take like one part right here and then break it up to another part over here. Uh, that, those are options as well. And so we can build functions using these different families and these different techniques, right? If you throw in if you throw in trigonometric functions into that mix, this gives us the family of so-called elementary functions. Uh, you take the trigonometric, the transcendental, the algebraic functions all together and combine them in all these different algebraic ways, you get what's called in calculus the elementary functions. Now, in this lecture series, we won't be using any of the trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, etc., but we will fit, stick with like log, the algebraic and transcendental functions of exponentials and logarithms. If, that, if we have a function that's given in this algebraic sense, how do we determine what the domain is? Well, by the domain convention, we just look for the problems, right? What can cause certain types of discontinuities to the graph? And it turns out for all the functions we've studied and all of these ways we can create new functions from old functions, there's only three real problems that we have to look out for. So the first problem is division by zero. If you have a rational expression of any kind, it could be a rational function with the denominator, numerator, polynomials, but hey, the denominator could be a square root, it could be a logarithm, it could be whatever. Whenever you divide by some variable quantity, we have to be concerned that a choice of X could make the denominator go to zero. And therefore, if you divide by zero, that will not be a well-defined real number. I mean, it's gonna, it probably will give you a vertical asymptote because your function will probably be approaching infinity or negative infinity. That's not a guarantee because you do have removable discontinuities. 
But division by zero does cause problems with the domain. So whatever values of X make the denominator of anything go to zero, we have to throw it out of the domain, okay? Um, and I should also mention that when considering the domain of a function, we should always use the original expression, which is not simplified uh, or manipulated by factor or anything like that. Because the original expression needs to be defined, not some simplified version. So things like the following of y equals x minus 1 over x minus 1, the temptation is to, fa to simplify it and get, oh, this is just the constant function 1. Well, that's almost true, except the original expression is not defined when x equals 1. Uh, because when x equals 1, you get 0 over 0, which is not the number 1. It actually is not a real number. It does not exist. So you have to make sure that when you consider domain, you always use the original unsimplified, unmanipulated form. Because uh, sometimes you get things wrong otherwise if you try to simplify it. Simplifying is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But you need to remember the exceptions to the domain that exist in the original form. Because x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 does not always equal 1. Um, it equals 1 only when x doesn't itself equal 1. All right. The second problem we have to look out for is taking the square root of a negative. Um, and when I say square root, I, of course, mean any even root. Uh, so like a fourth root, a sixth root. And that's because if you take like the sixth root of negative one by exponent properties, you can actually factor this as the cube root of the square root of negative one. So whenever there's an even root in play, you really have like a square root in play. So we have to look out for square roots of negatives. And that's because, again, our rule is we have real numbers going in and we have real numbers coming out. Dividing by zero does not produce a real number. It actually produces, if anything, like an infinite number. That's not a real number. Infinity and negative infinity are not real numbers. Uh, when it comes to square roots of negatives, right, you have a real number coming in like negative one, but the output is not a real number. You get a you get an imaginary number in that situation. So for our functions, we can't be taking square roots of negatives. And the same problem basically happens when you take the logarithm of a non-positive number. If you take the logarithm of a negative number, so you take like the natural log of negative one, this will actually produce an imaginary number like pi i, which we don't have to worry about what that is, but be aware that taking the, 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 the natural log or any log of a negative produces imaginary numbers, much in the same way taking the square root of the negative does. And then when you take like the, if you take like the natural log of zero, that actually produces negative infinity, so to speak. Uh, and that's because when you get closer and closer to zero on the natural log or any log without transformations, that's going to be a vertical asymptote. So it's kind of like dividing by zero. So logarithm is, the logarithm of a zero and a logarithm of negative is kind of reproducing these problems right here. Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want vertical asymptotes. We don't want imaginary numbers inside of our graphs. So what I want to do is then I'm going to look at uh, a list of functions, and we want to analyze their domains based upon these three conditions right here. What makes a denominator go to zero? Do we ever take the square root of a negative? And do we ever take the logarithm of a non-positive? Those are the only three problems we really are going to see when you are working with these algebraic functions. Because when you add together two functions, you the only restrictions you have are the restrictions that were already there. Okay, if you subtract a func two functions or you multiply them as well, the only restrictions to the domains that the, the difference in the product will have will be those restrictions that already existed. Now, if you take two functions and you divide them, like f of x divided by g of x, you'll have the restrictions you already had, but you could also introduce new restrictions based upon dividing by zero. But hey, that's already in our list, so we don't have to worry about that. When it comes to composition, when you put one function inside of it, uh, so you take something like f composed with g. Well, if g has any restrictions, then the composition will still have that because g had some problem with division by zero or square roots of logs. We put that inside. Those are still going to be there. Or we have to also make sure that what goes out of g fits inside of f. But again, that's because f either was divided by zero, taking square roots or logs or whatever. So you'll be able to see that very quickly. Um, the last one when it comes to piecewise functions, piecewise functions... Uh, could have restrictions to their domains that go beyond this list. But by nature, when it comes to a piecewise function, you have these different pieces. You have to specify on this piece, here's the domain. On this piece, here's the domain. On this piece, here's the domain. So since the domain is actually explicit for a piecewise function, that really doesn't cause us an obstruction whatsoever. So it's just these three principles that one has to worry about. And even still, when you start introducing trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, tangent, the only problems they ever have is actually division by zero 
because tangent is like sine over cosine. So that's not a new problem. So really then in trigonometry, the only thing we have to worry about is like arc sine, arc, uh, arc cosine. Those inverse trig functions can have restrictions on their domains, uh, which we would talk about that in a trigonometric setting, which we're not going to do that here. So let's look at our functions. Let's find the domain of the following algebraic functions, assuming they're as big as possible. What are the problems we see here? Well, looking at the function, we have a rational function, f of x equals 49 minus x squared over 7 minus x. All right. It's a rational function. There's no square roots. There's no logarithms, but there is division, right? So we have to see what makes the denominator go to zero. So when we solve that equation, 7 minus x equals zero, we can add x to both sides. Uh, and we see that x well, 7 equals x. So that was what makes the denominator go to 0. So the domain of f is then going to be all real numbers x such that x does not equal 7. That's the only problem, which oftentimes you're asked to put this in inter interval notation. So we're going to get the interval negative infinity to 7 union 7 to infinity, for which we don't we put a, we never put a bracket next to infinity or negative infinity because uh, those are not real numbers, so they're not included in the domain. We also don't put a bracket by the 7 because we don't include 7. 7 is actually the exception there. Uh, let's take g of x this time to be the square root of x minus 3. There's no division. There's no logarithm, so no worry if it's there. But we do have a square root, right? So the radicand, the expression inside of the square root, needs to be positive. So we take we have to solve the inequality x minus 3 has to be greater than equal to 0. Now, the difficulty of this inequality comes down to the complexity of the radicand. The more complicated the radicand is, the more challenging this inequality could be. This is just a linear inequality. We could add 3 to both sides and get x is greater than equal to, uh, greater than equal to 3. And so, therefore, the domain of our function would then be uh, we want all real numbers such that x is greater than equal to 3. Or in interval notation, this would look like bracket 3 to infinity. Uh, so we want all numbers greater than 3, but we also can allow 3 itself because if you take g of 3 right here, you get the square root of 3 minus 3, which is the square root of 0. This is a well-defined number. This is just 0 itself. Now, I do want to point out to you that if this problem was slightly changed, if you took like the fourth root of x minus 3, this would make no difference on the domain. The domain would still be 3 to infinity. On the other hand, if you took g of x to be like the cube root, of x minus 3. In that situation, the domain would actually be all real numbers. All real numbers here. And that's because odd radicals have no restrictions. It's only the even ones we have to look out for. Uh, so let's consider the function this time. h of x equals the absolute value of 4x plus 2. So this is an absolute value function, which if you want to, you could think of it as a piecewise function, right? Where this looks like 4x plus 5 when you're greater when you know when you're positive right or it's like negative you could try to break it up in this piecewise function but really it doesn't you don't need to do that absolute value is a very special piecewise function that again you, you can benefit from thinking about the piecewise function but you really have to do that often basically here think of this in terms of composition right this function is going to look like the absolute value of u composed with the linear function 4x plus 5 so that as we put the linear function inside of the absolute value now, linear functions have no restriction on their domain. So their domain here, so for the first one, it's going to be all real numbers, right? And as for absolute value, absolute value also has as its domain all real numbers. And so as both functions uh, in the composition here have domains as real, all real numbers, there's no problem, right? The operations in play are addition, multiplication, and absolute value. None of those are restricted. So the domain of H here is going to be all real numbers. Like so. So oftentimes when you look at a function, there are no restrictions that you have to worry about. There's no division by zero. There's no square roots. There's no logarithms. We can move on and be happy that the domain is all real numbers. So how about this one right here? F of X equals X squared times two to the X plus the natural log of X minus one. So searching through this function, we have a power function that has no restriction on its domain. We have an exponential function, two to the X. It has no restriction on domain. Um, we have a logarithm, aha. So notice here you have actually two functions in play. You have a function plus a function. Like we mentioned earlier, when you add two functions together, you just look at the restriction of each of the terms in the sum. The first one has no restriction, so no big deal. We look at the natural log of x, uh, x minus 1, excuse me, which, much like the square root, in order for this thing to be well-defined, real, a well-defined real number, we need that x minus 1 has to be positive. So we solve the inequality x minus 1 is greater than 0. This, of course, is the critical difference between square roots and logs here. The square root, while you could take the square root of zero, 
the square root of the natural log of zero is not a real number. So we actually need a strict inequality. But then you solve it, you add one to both sides, you get x is greater than one. And so we see the domain here of f is gonna be all real numbers, x, such that x is greater than one, or an interval notation, we get one to infinity. So we only look at the pieces that have restrictions. The ones that don't, we can kind of move on from them. We don't have to worry about it. All right, let's look at example E right here. So this one's got a couple issues, right? So we notice the numerator has the sixth root of x squared minus one. Because this is a sixth root, this is an even root. So this suggests to us a potential problem that we could be taking the square root of a negative. So we need to solve the inequality x squared minus one is greater than equal to zero. Equal to zero is okay here. Another concern we have to deal with is the denominator, right? We have this one plus two x e to the x right here. If there was a choice of x that makes this go to zero, we need to know it. So we need to solve the equation one plus two e to the x equals zero. So we solve both of these here. Let's start with the inequality. Um, the inequality, it's a quadratic inequality, which we can, the right-hand side's already zero. That's great about these ones. Factor the left-hand side as a difference of squares. You get x minus one times x plus one is greater than equal to zero. If we think of this graphically, right, x squared minus one looks like a parabola uh, that's been, that moved down by negative one. So you can have two, two markers here. Uh, you have plus one and negative one. Where is it above the x-axis? It's going to be above the x-axis when you're to the left and to the right of these values. So you take the wings of the bird here. So this suggests to us that the domain restriction from the numerator is that we have negative infinity to negative 1 bracket, union bracket 1 to infinity. That's what the sixth root says, that the sixth root will not be defined when you're between negative 1 and 1. Uh, what about the division by 0? What Could the denominator go to 0? Well, as you start solving this one here, let's let's minus one from both sides of the equation, right? That then gives us two e to the x is equal to negative one. Uh, divide both sides by two. We end up with e to the x is equal to negative one half. Now, some of us might have already detected an issue right here. An exponential function can't equal a negative. That's outside of its range. Uh, for which that would then be enough to tell us that eh, there's no solution to this. Um, which, if we didn't see that, we could keep on going. The next thing to do would be to take the natural log of both sides, in which case you then get x equals the natural log of negative one-half, which that should then cause us some alarm, especially if we throw in our calculator, because this is not a real number. This is not a real number, um, which we should have that very much in our minds right now because we're looking for domains. We know the natural log of a negative is not going to give us a real number. So this tells us there's no solution. So this equation, 1 plus 2e two two e to the x equals 0, has no solution. There is no value of x that will make the denominator go to 0. So the denominator actually provided no restriction. It could have. We didn't know that. But it turns out there's no restriction. And therefore, the domain of g is going to be negative infinity to negative one union one to infinity that the sixth root provided an obstruction to the uh, to the domain but the denominator which potentially did it didn't though and that's the thing is we have to investigate that we have to look at all allegations of domain irregularities but sometimes those allegations turn out to be false the denominator really didn't go to zero so be vigilant in your search there and then let's look at one last example here to illustrate what's going on here. So we have h of x equals the square root of x plus 1 divided by x minus 3 minus 1 over 3 minus the natural log or the log base 2 of 16 minus x. Oh boy, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There are two pieces. There's this square root piece and there's this division by a logarithm piece. Because we have a subtraction of two functions, we have to look at their domains separately. So let's look at the first one right here. If we pull that out, what problems do we see? Well, inside of the square root, well, let's just stop there for a second. The square root, hey, we have to take the square root of x plus 1 over x minus 3. So x plus 1 over x minus 3, that needs to be greater than or equal to 0. Because if we take the square root of a negative, that's not going to work. But we also have the concern, right, that we have a denominator, this x minus 3. This x minus 3 here needs to be non-zero. x minus 3, needs, we need to figure out when that's equal to 0. So that's that, that equation is easy to see here, right? x equals 3 is the problem. So we need to make x not equal to 3, right? But then when we come over here back to our inequality, we can think of this rational function. If we were to kind of graph it really quick, 
And we don't need a very good graph. We just a, a very quick one will work. So we have a vertical asymptote at three. That's something to remember. Um, the numerator is going to go to zero at negative one. So it's like an x-intercept. Because it's a balanced rational function, we see that there'll be a horizontal asymptote at y equals one, the ratio of their leading coefficients, like so. Uh, and then finally, if we think of like the y-axis right here, we can think of the y-intercept, which you plug in x equals zero, you'd get one over negative three, so negative one third. And so connecting the dots, we get a picture that would look something like the following, like so, and then like this right here. For which then, uh, looking at the picture, we see that it's positive when you're to the left of negative one, and when it's positive when you're to the right of three. If we put these two pieces together, we see the domain is going to be negative infinity up until negative one. Negative one will be included in there uh, because negative one makes the ratio go to zero, which zero can be greater than or equal to zero, right? Then we're going to get union. We're going to go from three to infinity in that situation. Now, three will not be included this time because notice dividing or plugging in x equals three divides by zero. Uh, let's move on to the second part right here. Let's look at this, this rational expression. Well, I see some two issues going on here. So we have a logarithm. So the, the, the operand of the logarithm needs to be positive. So we need 16 minus x to be greater than zero. This tells us that uh, 16 should be greater than x or x is less than 16 okay uh, but we also need that 3 minus the nat or the log base 2 of 16 minus x this should not equal 0 so when is it equal to 0 if i move the log to the right hand side of the equation we're going to get 3 is equal to the log base 2 of 16 minus x i want to move the the base 2 to the other side it switches from a logarithm to an exponential so we're going to get 16 minus x is equal to 2 cubed, which is, in fact, equal to 8. Subtracting 16 from both sides, we get negative x is equal to negative 8. Therefore, x equals 8. So x equals 8, of course, is the value that we shouldn't have. When x equals 8, that makes the denominator go to 0. So we don't want 8, but we have to also be less than 16. So the second function, the second part of the function suggests to us that we're going to go from, we have to be less than 16, so we're going to go from negative infinity up to 8, jump over 8, play a little leapfrog right there, up to 16, where 16 is not included. And so we have to put these things together. Like, where do these things overlap? And if it helps, you can draw a picture of such a thing. Think of something like this. Let's think of these important values. Uh, so we should be thinking of the number negative 1. We should be thinking of the value 3. In which case, if we color that in, we have this portion right here and this portion right here. Uh, but when we think of the blue one, we have 8, which is like over here. This is not drawn to scale, of course, and 16. So we want to be less than 8. And we want to be between 8 and 16. So we're going to draw like an open circle right here. This suggests we don't have that. So where are these things double overlap, right? So they're going to overlap on this portion when you're less than negative one, um, as you then go from above three up to eight and then from eight to 16. So if you look at the intersection here, this tells us that the domain of our function h will be given as negative infinity up to negative one. Negative one was included into that. We then take the union where we're gonna go from three, three was not included because it divides by zero up to eight, eight's not included because that also led to division by zero. Then you're gonna jump over eight and go up to 16. So that one is a little bit more complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces going on there, but we see we have the skill set we need to determine the domain of any elementary function. Again, I'm not talking about trigonometric functions here, but those, those extra trigonometric functions don't really make the domain much more difficult to do than we've already done in this example here. So I hope this review of computing domains of, of functions was helpful. Um, we learned how to find the domain of numerical functions, graphical functions, and we spent the most time on learning algebraic functions. The fourth representation of a function, a verbal one, like a story problem, uh, that one's, I, I really can't give you too many general tips at this moment because it depends on the problem. Can we accept uh, X or Y to be a decimal or a fraction? Or does it have to be a whole number? Can they be negative? 
Uh, yeah, that, that depends on the context. And so those would be things you have to treat on a case-by-case -case situation. If you feel like you learned something about domains today, uh, please feel free to hit the like button. Also feel free to subscribe uh, so you can see more videos, uh, math videos like this in the future if you're interested. Thank you, everyone. See you later.